you so much, and uh, my pleasure to be here. And thanks to everybody at Bullhorn for the opportunity to present today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, um, my apologies. For some reason, I was thinking we had about seven hours and 15 minutes to cover content. So I put a few too many slides into today. So I'm gonna go as quickly as I can. But if questions pop up, um, type them in the, in the question box and go to webinar. Uh, we'll answer what we can before we run out of time at the end. And anything that I can't get to live, I promise that I'll, uh, I'll shoot you an email afterwards with uh, responses to any questions you may have. All right, so we are here today to talk about stopping the leaks in your staffing website. And you know, why are we having this, this discussion? And the, and the answer is because we look at analytics at Haley Marketing Group on more than 500 staffing and recruiting firm sites every month. And what we consistently see is every site we look at gets a lot of traffic that doesn't convert, doesn't take action. And these days with 3.6% unemployment, when you are trying to figure out how do I get that job order filled, uh, we can't afford to be losing candidates visiting our site. And when clients visit, we got to make sure we're also engaging them and driving them to the place that they can take action. So let's start with a quick overview of what's wrong with most staffing websites. And the really good news is there's not nearly that much that's wrong with most websites these days. If we went back four or five years ago, um, we could bring up example after example of horrible staffing website. But today, if we look around probably most of the websites of people who are on today's webinar, you're gonna find that you've, you've got a pretty good design. The designs have gotten much better in the last few years. We're seeing more original and unique imagery, not just the same stock photos, although we'll talk more about that later. We're seeing more engaging copy. Um, copy that really pulls a reader in, that effectively conveys a staffing firm's brand, that gives people a reason to take action. We're seeing better features. There's more ways to engage clients and candidates through staffing websites than ever. It's not just brochureware anymore. And um, we're seeing sites finally have gotten the message and almost everybody, not everybody, almost everybody is now mobile optimized building responsive websites that, so when you pull out a smartphone, the site is usable. All right, but despite how far we've come, we still have a long way to go. There are still a lot of leaks. And so where are some of the leaks we see? Well, let's start with talent leaks. And most of the talent leaks, you know, we're gonna start at the end of the funnel. If you think about the goal of your website, it's, to attract people to find your site, to bring them into the site, to get them to your jobs, to get them to find the job that's relevant for them and to get them to apply. Well, if we start at the end of the process, the application form and ATS integration. Now, hopefully most of you are using the Bullhorn Career Portal or you're using Haley Marketing's job board software, but you have a really good integration so that your jobs go into Bullhorn, they go to your website, it's seamless. Hopefully you have an application form truly optimized to get people to apply, and we're gonna talk about that at length in a little bit. But often the job post to the apply, there's a huge fall off that you get the candidate to a job post, but the job post doesn't sell the candidate. They don't click apply. Sometimes it's higher in the process, it's searching jobs. I've seen examples, some Bullhorn clients, where they've built their own job search capability. And one of the things that I saw is that it would say keyword, location, category, and those were all fill in the blanks boxes. Well, if I'm a candidate, how do I know where you have jobs, all the locations? How do I know the categories to search for? So we need to make sure that the search is intuitive, that we make it easy for the candidate. We're gonna talk more about this in a little bit. But what about candidates who aren't ready to apply? A lot of people are gonna to get to your website, they're, they're passively active, they're looking at jobs, but they're not really ready to apply yet. What options do you give them to take action so that you can start to engage them? And how about calls to action, CTAs? We see site after site after site that either have no calls to action or very weak calls to action so that you're not directing the candidate, 
you're not directing these people to do what you want them to do, to do things that they want to accomplish. Um, so those lack of calls to action result in a huge fall off. And then entry pages that fail to convert. And we're, again, we'll talk about this one a little bit as well. But the place people come into your website may or may not be the home page of your website. And you have to look in the analytics and you have to see where are people coming into the entry page of my site and is every entry page optimized to drive people to take action. How about on the client side? Now, I know that today's webinar is mostly going to be about talent because that's what you need, but there's some client side leaks. The big one that is, this applies to clients and candidates is lack of differentiation. I look at your site and do I instantly know what you do? Do I instantly know why you're different? Do I instantly know why I would want to work with you? Um, very often, there's little or no differentiation, and I see a ton of sites where there's some clever copy that if you really read the words means nothing. It means something to you because you're in the staffing industry, but not to your prospective client, not to your prospective candidate. That ties to fail, uh, sites that fail to clearly convey the value being delivered. If I'm an employer and I can choose from 500 staffing firms in Boston, why do I choose you if you're in Boston? What's the unique value that you can bring to my organization that my current vendor is failing to deliver to me. Even more so on the client side than the candidate side, we see non-existent calls to action. There's just nothing there for the employer to really make them stick around in your site, make them engage with you. Again, entry pages that fail to convert. For an employer, they may be even more likely than a candidate to enter your website through a blog post or through a page that is not necessarily your home page. And are those entry points designed so that if you're an employer, they're telling you what to do next. All right, so we're now going to go through and talk about how to plug these leaks. And, and I call it a top to bottom approach. So we're going to start on the home page. So uh, I've taken a picture of a website that I found um, and I hid the name to protect the guilty here. Um, this is not a terrible looking website, but it is a website that's a good example of homepage leaks. So when I look at this site, it fails the three second rule. In three seconds of looking at this site, I don't know what this company does, what's their, what they're all about, why I'd wanna work with them, or even who the site's for. We empower our clients through people, technology, and resilience. If I knew I was coming to a staffing firm's website, and if I knew something about what this company did, that sentence might make sense to me. But what if I, if I didn't? What about if I found them on a Google search? This doesn't tell me at all about who they serve, what they do, or what their value is. There's no clear call to action. There's a menu at the top, so I know that, but that's not really a good call to action. There's a button on the page that says, about us. Is that the number one thing people want when they come to your website to learn about you? Uh, hint, the answer is no. And this site didn't necessarily fail, but we see a lot of websites that are too slow to load. There's kind of a, a rule, anything less than, anything more than two seconds is too slow to load. So how do we start to fix some of these leaks? Well, on the home page, it's about having deliberate messaging, actually thinking through almost in a billboard-like mentality, what's the message we want to deliver to our primary audience whether it's employers, job seekers, or both, what's the message in 10 words or less that we want through is our headline? What's our sub-headline that clarifies that message? So this one's really simple. Great jobs, talented people, and exceptional results. Working Solutions is your flexible employment specialist. Call to action, get hired, hire talent, then you see a fly-in on the right that we're hiring search now. You'll notice that this site in the beginning has very little copy. Now, we're seeing a lot of staffing websites doing this, and this is part of the three-second rule. You have about three seconds to get your basic message through to somebody, get them to continue on deeper into the site. And when your homepage and executive recruiters on today's call, I'm, I'm looking at you because this happens more in recruiting sites than staffing sites, when your homepage is long body copy, because maybe some SEO person told you you need to have at least 500 words of copy on your homepage, that is maybe great for a search engine. It's lousy for a human. And so we need to get our wording down to a less is more mentality. Uh, the long copy has a place in the site. We'll talk about that a little bit, but not at the first entry page. 
are there multiple calls to action on your homepage? Here, if I'm an employer, I can, I can go to hire talent. If I'm a job seeker, I've got get hired. I've got search now under we're hiring that grabs my attention because it flies in. I have a box that says, you deserve to love your job. Let working solutions find the job you were made to do. Job skills, location, drop down, industry, drop down, search jobs, button. Really easy to understand what I can do as a job seeker on this site before I even start to hunt through the main navigation. All right, speed. So this is a lot of technical stuff. This is what you need to tell your, your web developer to look at, but are they minimizing the size of the HTML and the CSS? Have they set up if caching so that a page content is cached, is stored in memory, uh, so that when somebody comes to your website, the most commonly searched content loads fast? Have they run image compression to minimize the size of all the graphics used on your site? Are they limiting the number of plugins? So you're using the ones that are necessary to drive user experience, but not adding a lot of weight, a lot of bloat to the site. And are you using a hosting platform that's really optimized for the platform your website is built on? We build all our websites on WordPress. It's the number one content management and WordPress development platform on the planet. So we host our sites, when we host for our clients, we actually work with a company that all they do is WordPress hosting and they are awesome at ensuring WordPress websites run at their peak speed. You can see this site that we built you know, has a 99 for its paid load speed because that's as good as you can get. If you wanna test your site, you can go to Google Page Speed Insights, you type in your URL and it will show you the speed performance on desktop and mobile. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, even with some of the sites that we're building is, you know, on mobile, a lot of sites are responsive, but responsive may not be fast. And we really have to get web developers to think about how do we change the mobile experience to make it even faster? Because if we're impatient on desktop, we're even more impatient on mobile for a site to load. And typically, probably most of the people listening today, your site's actually slower on mobile than desktop. How about navigation leaks? So you see a picture on screen that is a very typical staffing firm nav bar about clients, candidates, jobs, locations, news. Well, this is an example of a structure that is not aligned with user intent and that's a big leak. Who's coming to your website more than anybody else? The answer is talent, candidates. So the first thing in the nav bar should be geared towards what candidates want to find. In this case, candidates would go before about and before clients. But even other things, does the word candidate even make sense? I know lots of websites in our industry use that word jargon and they use the word clients as well. But a client means what? Somebody who's doing business with you. So if I'm an employer who's not doing business with you, does clients really make sense? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I don't click on that because I don't get it. Candidates, if I'm not used to working in the staffing industry, I've never worked as a contractor or a temporary employee before, do I know what candidates means? Uh, candidates is what we think about from politicians. So why not use words that fit the user intent? Employers, job seekers, find work, find talent, looking for a job, looking to hire, use words in your navigation that are aligned with the user's intent. Then there's too many clicks. Now, I didn't put a picture of an example, but I wanna be able to get to where I'm looking to go, ideally in one click. Is your site designed to do that? Then there's my personal pet peeve, sites that are optimized for mobile, but not desktop. And you see that little symbol called the hamburger menu as the navigation on desktop. It makes total sense on mobile because Having the hamburger menu conserves space. It hides your navigation behind a button. You click the button, you see the nav. And a lot of people went to a mobile first design where they did that on desktop and they have the hamburger menu and then you have to click that to go to navigation. Well, on desktop, that makes no sense. Why do we make people have an extra clip just to figure out what your navigation is? Not good design from a navigation standpoint. So how do we fix it? Step one is through information architecture. One of the things we do when we start to work on a website is think through the page structure. So the picture you see on screen is an example of something we call an all-inclusive website. But we have a structure that is aligned with user intent. Jobs come before the stuff for employers, come before specialties and about us. 
um, contact us is naturally on the right hand side where people are going to look. We think through all of the ways that we want the candidate, the client to take action. And we're planning through where are all the interactive features? There are those things that are ovals. How do we get people to the interactive features? That is all part of the thought process before you ever start worrying about design. We want to make sure the navigation is intuitive. Are we using an order that makes sense? And are we using wording that makes sense? Job seekers services, that's our jobs and services. That's real simple in this example. But as I mentioned, it could be job seekers, employers. It could be looking for work, looking for talent. You could play with lots of different variations of that, but make sure that the wording is something that if you handed it to your grandmother or a four-year-old, now well, maybe that's too young, a seven-year-old, they could look at the wording and go, oh, I get what this is all about. You shouldn't need to be a professional job searcher or a staffing professional to understand the navigation. So what we want to think about is also having appropriate versions for mobile and desktop. Not only is the design responsive, but as you can see on screen, and it's a little small, like on desktop or here on tablet, the navigation goes across the top. It's easy to read. On mobile, we go to the hamburger version. We want to make sure that appropriate navigation appears in both areas. The, find jobs, find talent, the green and red box here, that's a form of navigation, which is carried over from tablet or desktop to mobile, but on mobile it gets much smaller so that you're not taking up all of the visual space to get through the basic message about the company. On desktop, it's very appropriate. On desktop, this particular website, if you put your mouse over jobs or talent, uses JavaScript to do some really cool animation so that it brings through more depth if you're a job seeker or you're an employer about what you can do as a next step. Well, you're not going to do that all on mobile. So on mobile, that's done with text and with information that scrolls on the home page. Another idea, and this is not something everybody will want to do, but is to use large format dropdowns so that when I either click on or hover over the main navigation on the website, not only do I see all the sub pages, but I see a large bar where you've got a call to action defined, you've indicated all of the sub pages that I can access within that section of the website. And essentially you're making it so within one click, I can go from the main navigation to any page in the website. Now this form of navigation is really desktop or tablet only. It's not gonna be on your phone, but it is an effective way to drive response and to simplify getting to desired content on desktop version of your site. All right, our third leak, entry pages, how people get into your website. So the biggest mistake we see here is there's no conversion path. And the diagram on the right sort of shows the idea is a prospect comes to a website page. Somewhere on that page, you've got a call to action. The call to action leads to another page, a landing page in your website, where there's some ability to take action or response vehicle. So on your website, you have to look at all of your entry pages, your home page, the top of your blog, the individual blog post. If you have separate locations pages, each locations page or each office page. If you have the specialties pages, they may be an entry point. Your contact page, your job seekers page, because may, many of you probably have noticed if you do a Google search, it doesn't just show the home page of your website, it will show a number of different pages that a visitor to Google can go directly to. Well, have you thought through conversion path on all of your entry pages? So what actions are you trying to drive someone to from a blog post, from a locations page? If someone's on a job seekers page, clearly the intent is find work. How do we get them to that? However, if you're on a blog post, it could be an employer or a job seeker. Or maybe I have different variations. If it's an employer focused post, what's my conversion path? If it's a job seeker focused post, what's my conversion path? When someone's consuming content on a blog post, their interest level is more about other content. So my conversion path may be content oriented. Whereas when I'm on a job seeker page or a contact page, my conversion path is taking action to engage with your staffing firm. So now it's gonna be searching jobs, apply now, contact us, call us. So you just want to think through the actions based on the entry pages and design your website to get people to take those actions. So more ways to fix those entry page leaks. 
thinking about all of the different actions people might want to take. I can show off feature jobs. So maybe you pull the best of your best jobs to the home page of your website, to the top of the job seekers page. If there's anybody on the webinar who does light industrial staffing, you may have some really good jobs and some not so good jobs. So rather than just showing a few recent jobs, feature the ones with the highest pay, the marquee employers, the best geographic location, the best shifts. And this works the same if it's IT, healthcare, but feature your most desirable jobs in the places people come to first. Have a search widget so that I don't have to just go to your job board to do the searching. I can run a search from any page on the website. You saw the example on the working solutions. You deserve to love your job. That's a widget that calls our job board software right from the home page of their website. And they can put that widget in a sidebar on any page, uh, horizontally across any page, on mobile, on any page in their website, so they can bring searching easily to any page on the site. Thinking about internal links, I want to drive people from my entry page to another page. That can be with a text link, a graphical link, a button link, but I want to link people to the content they're likely to want next. So mentally, you're asking yourself the question, hey, if somebody comes to this page, what's their intent? What's the question they're asking our organization that I can help answer and drive them to next? And that's where your internal links want to drive them to, is make it easy to get to the next step. Lots of other CTAs, and you can brainstorm these calls to action with your team. So search jobs is the most obvious one. Uh, apply now, people who can apply without having to actually apply to a specific job. An opt-in for a job search, you see that in the green box in the upper right corner. The, an offer for free content, so whether it's an ebook, a white paper, an on-demand web webinar, a video to watch, you can offer that and drive people to a landing page. The ability to request an employee, even though most of your clients may call you when they have a job order, you want to facilitate them making that call. Or if they've worked with you in the past, maybe be able to pull up an old job order so that they can easily reorder the talent they need. Or potentially even searching your featured talent, pulling candidates directly out of Bullhorn, pulling them into your website and allowing clients who want to look on their own to find the talent that you have. And you see some examples of on screen, the search widget, the opting in for job alerts, even the, uh, the one that says contact us today, that's a call to action graphic that is actually part of a widget that we provide with our websites that allows it, you to create a graphical call to action after every blog post. And the last thing you see on screen is chat feature. If you're like most staffing and recruiting firms, you are not available 24-7. So having a live chat or an automated chat feature, a chat bot on your site so people can start to engage with you when they want to. Some people don't want to talk to a live person right away. Let them talk to a bot. Some people do. Make it so they can get to a live person. So you see the bot there named Lexi from Frontline Source Group. If people click, I'm looking for a job or I need to hire, they go through a scripted dialogue to engage with Frontline Source Group and Frontline drives them to the right actions. I will tell you that if it says I need to hire people, they have a live recruiter talking to that customer within one minute because they want anybody who's looking to hire to immediately have a service experience with a live human being. But with talent, they let the bot do the work. They also have frequently asked questions and a five-year warranty guarantee on their website because they have some unique benefits that they're selling and they wanna make it easy for people to find the content they want and they use their chat bot to do all of these things. All right, let's get to one of the biggies, your career portal. What are the leaks in the career portal? Number one, searching and filtering. So you see on screen here an example, keyword location. That's not bad. You can enter a job title. So maybe I know the job title. But what if I entered a job title that's not an exact match? Does your site handle semantic search that finds a close match? Or categories. How would I know what category to enter here? I have no idea what categories this company hires for. There's no drop down. Same thing with location. Now, maybe I'm I'm only looking in my local market and I'm gonna just type in my, my zip, but this has city, state, or zip code. So unless you're a big company with jobs everywhere, I could guess four or five times and come up with no jobs. 
So make it easier for me to search and filter based on helping me fill in the blanks where you actually have jobs. Some of the best ones I've seen on the drop downs, they'll show you how many jobs match the categories. So you already know, like I'm looking for an electrical engineering job and there's 52 jobs available before you even select that criteria. How about the application process? How easy are you making it for the candidates? We have seen, and thankfully guys, this is not bullhorn, other ATS systems with up to a 95% abandonment rate on the application forms for their ATS. Uh, Bullhorn's process, open source career portal, Haley marketing job board software, uh, very low abandonment rate because the process is much easier. Giving people alternatives to apply. A lot of people, even when they're searching for jobs, they're not ready to apply. We've got to give them other choices. How about SEO and Google for jobs? Are your jobs fully optimized so they're found in search so they show up in that Google for jobs blue box? And are you doing talent re-engagement? A lot of people who visit your website the first time don't apply. In fact, in looking at Google Analytics across our clients, we found that somebody who comes back, a candidate who returns, is twice as likely to apply to a job as a first time visitor. Yet most of you probably have big budgets you're spending on recruitment advertising and very small, if any, budget spent on bringing those candidates back a second time. All right, so let's fix the leaks. So searching and filtering. First thing is, do I want to have search versus display all? If I'm a recruiting firm and I only have five or 10 or 15 jobs, I might have a display all. There's no reason to make someone search jobs if there's a small number. But if I've got more than one screen's worth of jobs, then I want to have some sort of search where people can search by filters that make sense, keyword, location, a radius search. Give me a geography of so many miles around the area where I want to work. Give me an industry drop down or an employment type. Am I looking for contract, contract to hire full time? Give me the ability to refine my search as best I can and then make it so that that is available to do that searching anywhere on the website. You also see on the page here in the bottom right, it says skip the search, uh, something that we put into our job board software. So if a candidate doesn't want to find a job that's matched for them, they want you to do the work. Or if a candidate can't find a job but still wants to work with you, they can skip the search and just submit their resume. I will say that's an optional feature in our software because not every staffing or recruiting firm wants that. But it's a great way to get candidates to engage who may not have the time to search or may not see the right job on your website. Then the apply process, shorten the form. There's an adage in building web forms that every question over three starts to reduce response. I just looked at an example right before today's call, um, somebody who's integrated, again, thankfully it's not Bullhorn, another ATS, and they had about 30 different fields to fill in. I didn't even test it on mobile. This is on desktop and I'm like, there is no way in the world the high level candidates that this executive search firm wants are they gonna fill in all those fields. So they might get some candidates, but they're getting the more desperate candidates. The, the good candidates aren't gonna take that much time unless they're out of work. The passive candidates aren't gonna take that much time. When you do have a lot of fields you need to fill in, break the process into two steps. Step one, get me the bare minimum so I can see if I'm interested in you, your contact info and your resume or your LinkedIn profile. Once I have that, then I can follow up with saying, hey, you look great. Could you please fill in the rest of our application form? Or even on a thank you page for submitting the part one, we can ask them to do part two. Then there are the one click apply options. So you see the picture on screen, which is which I set up for just for today's webinar, which is sort of the ridiculous extreme of you know, what are all the different one click apply options if you turned on every single feature. So you can apply with Indeed, Monster, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Instagram, wherever people have already put their job and resume information, you just wanna make it easy for them to get whatever they can from the third party, grab it and send it to you. Because if they can do this, particularly on mobile, you would dramatically increase your response rate. Even if it's only giving you enough information to say, hey, can we go to the next step? That's enough for step one. And then you need the options other than apply. Uh, maybe I want to apply later. Just email, email me a link so that I can apply later. Chat with a recruiter. Uh, our software, we integrate with another Bullhorn Marketplace partner, Flash Recruit. Then turn on that button you see that says chat with a recruiter. You click that. 
right at that time, the software goes out and attempts to get the recruiter who's working on the specific job the candidate's looking at into a live chat. If that recruiter is unavailable, then a chat bot backs it up. But this way, the candidate can start to get questions answered when they're not ready to apply. They want to know more about the job. Uh, we sh candidates should be able to opt in for email and SMS text, job alerts. They should be able to refer friends to your job, share jobs on social media, or get access to free content. While I'm at your career portal, if I'm just really not ready to apply to a job, then maybe I can just give you some more information to help you in your job search before you leave. But you want to do everything possible before they're gone to have a way to engage, get them to engage with you so you can continue to nurture the relationship with the candidate. How about SEO? You want to make sure that every single job creates its own website page that is on your company domain. And you see the arrows here that show some of these things. The very top shows some of that on-page metadata, the page title. Page title of every job should list the job title, the location, right in the page title, because that tells Google this is what this page is about. Even though you can't read it all if you're a human, Google can read all of that. The URL should be on your domain with the job title, the location, and the word jobs in there. You should be using headlines and tagging the data so that Google knows and other search engines know what your job is all about. The most robust SEO content that you're creating are your jobs. And you want to make sure your jobs are helping you optimize your website because every job is its own web page. Every web page is optimized for search engines and specifically for Google for jobs. That means that there's structured data being put into the job post. So you see on the right something that says test your structured data. You can go to Google and type in structured data testing tool and it will bring up that box that you see. Then grab the URL of any job on your website and paste it into that box. When you click run test, you'll see the box on the bottom. The left side shows you the actual HTML code of the job. The right side shows you what Google can read about your job. If you don't see anything on the right, you're not optimized for Google for jobs. If you see something on the right and it shows errors or warnings, that means you've got data that's missing. And Google will highlight the errors and errors keep you out of the Google for jobs results. So if you have errors, they need to be corrected. And then there are warnings, data that's missing. Google will still put you in the results, but it would, there's data that it would like to see. Now for staffing and recruiting firms, there's two pieces of data that a lot of you don't want to include, but you should. Number one is salary. Whether the salary is good or bad, I know people don't necessarily want to include it because maybe it sets false expectations or maybe it'll chase people off, but jobs with salaries get 40% more applications than those without. Put salaries in there, even if they're not good salaries. Also, Google wants to see salary data, so if you're missing it, your job is not going to rate as well as somebody that has it. And then there's the single most controversial piece of data for the staffing industry. Google wants to know the street address where the job is, not your office's street address, where your client is. Most staffing and recruiting firms choose to omit this data. Um, we've set it up so it, you can turn it on or turn it off. However, Google wants people to be able to do a radius search. Give me a job near me. Give me a job on a bus route. And if you don't have the street address, Google can't answer that question for the searcher, so you're not as likely to show up in the job search box. Again, I know lots of staffing and recruiting firms will not turn that on, even though it's a best practice. Um, but for those who do, it will help where you show up in the Google for jobs results. Also, it will uh, help the job seeker to be able to better know exactly where they're going to be working. Now, the obvious problem is, hey, my competitors can see where my clients are. Yes, they can. And even though that information is never publicly displayed on your website, it is in the HTML, and so a really savvy competitor could go dig through it and figure out what the street address of your job. Well, my feeling personally is that if you're going to lose a client because a competitor knows where you have a job, you are going to lose the client anyway because guess what? The competitor is already calling on that company. So I would err on the side of optimizing my results, um, but ultimately the decision is yours. And lastly, in terms of Google for Jobs, you want to make sure that your job board provider is using the Google Jobs Discovery API, which is software that 
is used to tell Google when new jobs are available. When we turn this on for clients, we take their new jobs and we push them to Google to say, hey, here's a new job for you to index Google. And in five minutes, those jobs are showing up in the blue box on Google for jobs. So you want to make sure your jobs have the structured data and they're whatever service you're using is using the Google Jobs Discovery API to notify Google about all your new jobs. And then there's the talent re-engagement. So job alerts are the most obvious one, email-based alerts, text-based alerts. Um, the ability to have category mailings so that you can say, I want to take all of people who are interested in certain types of jobs, and I want to set up emails on either a set date or uh, ad hoc that will automatically go out to engage people interested in those types of jobs. So the picture on screen here shows industrial warehouse technical jobs that go out Wednesdays. And it will, you know, this is from our software, but it shows exactly how many people are going to receive the alert uh, and right now how many jobs would be in that alert. So this was done with demo data. So there was no specific jobs in the one that I uh, set up for today's webinar show a picture. But when you're doing category mailings, you would actually see exactly how many candidates are going to be notified of the jobs and how many jobs match the alert for this week or this month. And lastly, there's retargeting, using pay-per-click advertising on Google and on Facebook um, to have your company's brand, your ads, re-engage people who have been to your website to bring them back to search again for a new job. All right, let's move on to content leaks. So the biggest content leak is dull or me too copy. It just doesn't stand out. Then there's missing or weak calls to actions that we talked about earlier. And then there's content that's too wordy. And the picture you see on screen, when we're working with a client, uh, this is our ABC guide. And what we recommend companies do before starting a new website project is get together with your management team and think about the core messaging. At its most fundamental level, what do we want to say to employers and job seekers? And then get with your team and, and battle it out so we can get this down to the billboard rule of 10 words or less. In 10 words, what's the most important message to job seekers? In 10 words, what's the most important message to employer? Think about what the key messages are you need to do in terms of your positioning, your differentiation, your value proposition, and that has to be the focus of the content on your website. So you turn that internal discussion into clear messaging. You try to write shorter copy using headlines and subheadlines so somebody can skim through your website and understand what you're all about. You think about those conversion paths and calls to action on all pages of your website. So you're going to see the content on your website is directly related to what we talked about earlier, driving people to taking action and using the big text, the headlines, the smaller text, the subheadlines to get people to the CTA. Now, before we get to design leads, I, I, wanna, I wanna go back and one last thing. I mentioned earlier about long content. You still wanna have long content because that's great for SEO. The long content is deeper in your website, maybe on a specialties page, maybe on information about specific services. The value of long content, 500 plus words on a page, is that Google likes longer content in terms of indexing pages. So the higher level pages in your website are going to be for humans, but you want that deep content lower in the website for search engines. All right, design leaks. And I'm sure everybody's chuckling at the picture that's on screen. This is the uh, all things to all people picture, stock art that appears or some variation on so many staffing websites. But your biggest design leaks is, is the site outdated? Does the look, the feel, the content of our website match our brand and what we want to be known for today. If your site's more than five years old, it's probably outdated from a design perspective. If it's more than three years old, it's outdated from a technology perspective. Then there's the all things stock images. We don't want to offend anybody, so we have to be all things to all people, and we're going to pick stock images that really look like stock images. This doesn't mean you can't use stock photography. You just have to find ways to make the photography uniquely yours. And then we're the designs are not driving response, not using color, imagery, not using proportion to drive people down the page to the places that they can take action. And we're not really optimizing for desktop and mobile. And here I'm talking beyond responsive design. We'll see an example of that in just a minute. All right, so design. We want a clean, intuitive layout, something that's bold, bright, that really just pulls a viewer in. 
We want imagery that's branded to the company. It fits your personality. The picture you see on screen, that's stock art, but it doesn't look like a typical staffing company website. The use of colors, the use of the, the demographics of the individual who's on in the picture, uh, the expressions on her face, that's all part of the advanced group's brand. Bold calls to action, the contrasting colors, pretty easy to, easy here to find work, find people. If you're on their actual website, there's a really bold fly-in that gets people directly to search jobs right away. Leveraging the capabilities of the platform. Here you see the mobile version of the Panther Group's website, and I highlighted the bar at the bottom. So on mobile, Beyond responsive design, which is making the design fit the device, here we're now going a step further, actually adding additional buttons as an overlay on mobile that allow the job seeker or the employer to instantly take advantage of what they're looking to do. First thing I want to do on a phone maybe is call somebody, or I want to find the office location because I need directions. Then I might want to search jobs or contact you. But that bar is always available on the Panther Group's website, and that's only available on mobile because that's a mobile capability. Let's talk about it. search engine optimization leaks. And I think most people are doing some form of SEO, but we still see pages that are not at all optimized or websites that aren't optimized. But the bigger thing we see is bad SEO strategy. Things like the picture, best staffing agencies in Boston. The goal is to be number one for one search term instead of trying to maximize the amount of traffic you're getting from search. It's not bad to be number one for best staffing agency in Boston. But what if I typed in top staffing agencies in Boston or best financial staffing agency in Boston? I have to think about all the ways people are looking for me and have a strategy to maximize the people who are finding my website. Then I need a content strategy to go with it. And a lot of companies, they may have an SEO strategy, but no supporting content strategy. And they're not using data to drive content. And I'll explain that in just a moment. So first thing you need to do before you do any SEO is keyword research. We use Ahrefs and SEMrush to do research. What are people searching for? How popular are those search terms? How competitive are they? Where can we actually win if we're trying to compete from an SEO perspective? Then you go through on-page SEO. This is all the technical stuff to optimize your services page, your specialties page, your locations page, team profiles pages. These are the deep pages in your website with a lot of content that we're going to optimize for different ways people might be looking for you. But then we, more than anything, more than any of the initial website optimization, you need an ongoing content plan. Jobs are going to be part of your ongoing optimization strategy. Every job having its own page, every job being optimized, writing copy for your jobs around keywords, writing blog posts. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have if you want SEO. You have to be creating new fresh content that is written around the subjects of interest great ideas for your clients and your candidates. You want to think about case studies, things that both show off your value and are written to specific industries, specific types of clients so that people searching for that type of problem or solution find your websites. Testimonials, you want to create testimonials so that each one stands out as separate web content and then they aggregate together on a web page or they can be pulled into sections of your website. And even as you see on screen, Right now, talent profiles, actually converting your top candidates into content, content that used to skill market, content that's used for SEO. You see an example here of the Talent Showcase, software that we created to help companies with skill marketing so that they can more visually, more engaging way, get candidates placed faster, or in this market, show top talent we do more to get you placed. But that content, every profile is awesome for search engine optimization. And then content engagement. I know it's not enough just to have content. I got to get people to visit the content. So I want my website to suggest related content. I want them people to opt in for email newsletters and email alerts, maybe text alerts when there's new content. I want my team sharing the content on social media because social engagement enhances SEO. I want to use pay-per-click advertising to promote the content because the more traffic I have coming to my website and the longer people spend engaging with content on my website, the more Google sees your website as being relevant, the more it helps SEO. Even though social media and pay-per-click advertising are not SEO, they drive people to your website. And when those people spend time on your website, that helps with your SEO. All right, and our last big section, analytics leaks. 
So not looking at the data. I mentioned before those entry pages, exit pages. Ideally, everybody's leaving your website immediately after filling out a form or applying to a job. If they're leaving at other pages, you want to know those exit pages so you can go look at your calls to action, go look at your copy, go look at your design flow. Are we getting people to the right place? I want to know traffic sources and trends. Where are people coming from? Are they finding us on search? Are they finding us on social? Do we see this sort of hockey stick like trend in growth of traffic over time from search and social? I want to know what content people are actually looking at. What's popular? I should write more about topics that are popular. And if things people aren't looking at it at all, get them off the website. I want to know what keywords are driving traffic, which is not going to be as much looking at Google Analytics as it is going to be looking at that uh, SEM Rush and Ahrefs, which are paid tools that can help you analyze the keywords driving your traffic. And then not testing and adjusting your website based on what you learn, trying new calls to action, adding new content, adding new pages, lengthening pages, shortening pages, just testing things. A lot of times we see, and most times we see people build a website and think, oh, I'm done for five years. No, a website is dynamic. It should be changing all of the time. Just like your salespeople are making calls and adjusting their message to the audience, your website should be adjusting the message to clients and candidates based on what's happening in the marketplace. So what tools can you use? Number one is Google Analytics. So I can go in there and I can look at analytics to see all of the things that I previously mentioned. Uh, ROI dashboards, if your web software company, whoever built your website, doesn't give you some sort of a dashboard, find one that does. Um, you should be able to see things like the performance of your website, how many visitors, how many new visitors, how many people viewing your jobs, how many applications are you getting, what are the sources of your web traffic, what are the sources of your job applications, how many other forms are being filled out just by being able to log in and not having to be an expert at understanding Google Analytics. You should be doing quarterly reviews or more of the analytics, Google or otherwise, to say what have we learned, what's working, what's not working, what can we test for the next 90 days. And a few final considerations before we open it up for Q&A. Hosting. As I mentioned at the very beginning, you want a host that's optimized for the platform you're built on. Many of you are probably on WordPress. Um, you want to use a hosting company. I will tell you full transparency, our hosting partner is a company called WP Engine. They're awesome. Um, we host all of our clients' websites at WP Engine, but our job board software is hosted at Rackspace. So our job board software is hosted separately because Rackspace is better optimized uh, and Amazon Web Services is better optimized for native applications than a WordPress web hosting company. So we host our clients' websites in two different places to optimize performance. And you want to look at, is my career portal hosted at the same place as my website? Should they be? Or you know, is there somebody who's just managing all of this for me? Flexibility. Am I built on a platform that allows me to easily add new features? Am I built on a platform where there's a huge, robust development community making the site better? Uh, we chose WordPress a few years ago because we used to be on a proprietary content management system. And uh, that system just couldn't keep up with the open source development community that is WordPress. There were so many more plugins and features. Almost anything you could want, somebody has created. And you can get world-class software for low or no cost as a plugin to WordPress. So you want to have that flexibility to extend your site and enhance it, um, which ties into one of the things we're talking about in a second, ADA compliance. You know, that's becoming a huge issue for staffing and recruiting firms. And there are plugins available to help you evaluate your site and the performance. Also support. You need professional help if you're running a website. And if your nephew builds the site, you may have a great looking site, but is there someone there to give you guidance on how to ensure the site is performing well for job seekers, sure, performing well for, for employers, and can really brainstorm with you. What else can we do with our website to continue to enhance it? And last I mentioned is ADA compliance. There's a lot of lawsuits going on right now for the American with Disabilities Act. And if your website is not ADA compliant, most are not. We need to start to think about how can we get to the point we are compliant. Um, you may not be involved in a lawsuit, but also this opens up an entirely new talent pool. Is your website able to be used by somebody with a screen reader, someone who's blind? Is there enough color contrast, someone who's just vis visually impaired can actually read and use your site? So 
ADA compliance you're going to see in the next couple of years is going to be huge. And a lot of people are going to have to rebuild their websites to be compliant. Um, we're in the process right now of doing really deep dive research on ADA compliance to ensure we can meet all of the standards that are being set. Uh, compound that with the fact that California is in the process of rolling out some new restrictive rules on privacy and security. And uh, there's a lot of things that you're going to need to be aware of in the next one to two years with your website to drive performance. With that said, uh, let me turn around. Hey guys, I'm impressed that we got through seven hours of content in just 50 minutes, but let's open it up for questions. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, so we actually are a couple minutes over, so I think I'm just going to ask one question that came in that I think is really broad and, and pretty applicable to everyone who's, who's on here. Um, but the question is, if you had to pick one leak to fix first, where would you start? The bottom of the conversion funnel. So I look at all the last steps. Uh, I'd look at my career portal and say, is everything that was in the presentation being done to make sure people can apply? Is it super easy? Can they apply with one click? Are the jobs optimized? Are there separate job pages? I'd start there. If they're not, I'd fix that leak because if I'm spending a lot of money to get candidates to the website and then they don't apply, I'm wasting money at the top of the funnel. So I want to fix the bottom first and work my way back up to the entry pages on the site. Awesome. Thank you, David. So I'm going to go ahead and end it there for the webinar, but we did get a lot of questions that we don't have the opportunity to answer today. We will follow up with those uh, via email today and tomorrow, so you'll get your answers to those. And then in that email, we'll also share the recording of this webinar. So if there are any questions that you need to go back to listen to the answer to, those will be there as well. Thank you, everyone.